Okay guys, so what I wanted to do was to walk through the transmit architecture for those of you that still might be having a little bit of trouble and to try and make sure that you successfully get this implemented on time. So what you see in front of you is the architecture that I presented in class. What I'm going to do is walk through and explain it bit by bit, started in the upper left. The first thing to keep in mind is that communicating with the transmit engine, the trammel blaze needs to do an outport to port ID 0. So you want to do an output to port ID 0 with the data that you want to have sent. And at the end of the discussion we'll talk a little bit more about how to organize the data coming out. So when the trammel blaze writes, if you recall, the port ID is up for two clocks the ride strobe will be up for the second clock. That will cause the load signal to go high for one clock, which will clear the TX ready signal. We'll come back to this implementation in a second. When the load signal is generated, we have a loadable register that captures the data off the outport. This should be the data that you want the transmit engine to send out. Once the data has come into the load register, it will then pass through this encoder, which encodes according to the truth table below. Uh, depending on whether you selected 7 bits or 8 bits, whether parity is enabled, and if parity is enabled, whether it's up, odd high or even low. Please keep in mind when you generate the parity for 7 bits, so when 8 is a 0, that means you're transmitting 7 bits. You only want the parity to be generated across bits 6 through 0. When you're generating parity for all 8 bits, then you want the parity to be generated across bits 7 to 0. So once you load this register, there'll be a very fast propagation through this commodal cloud. 10 and 9 will be sitting there. The lower seven bits will be sitting here, and always we have a one and a zero. What I didn't mention is that the shift register, when reset, should be reset to all ones. The normal condition of the shift register is all ones, where we ensure that the TX line is held at a mark state, no activity. When the trammel blaze does the right, one clock later, load delayed by one, goes high for one clock and then transfers the lower seven bits with the encoded data with the zero and one into the shift register. Now we have the data formatted ready to be shifted out. The other thing to keep in mind is that as we're shifting our serial data in should always be a one. So as we're shifting out the data we are filling the shift register with ones. That is a very simple presentation of the data path into the shift register. If you should choose to debug that, it's fairly simple uh, in that you issue a write to port ID 0, you should see the load followed by load D1, and then you should be able to observe the shift register with the correctly formatted data. The other two portions of the machine are the bit time counter and the bit counter. In both cases the architecture should be familiar. It's our familiar pulse generator logic where we have a counter, a register that's acting as a counter, a comparator, and a MUX on the front end depending on what's going on. Now in this architecture it's a little more complicated. We have the signal do it now once we set the load D1, so once we've captured the data into the shift register that we want to send, the do it signal goes active and that tells our machine now is the time to perform the transfer. So whenever do it is a zero, then we keep the bit time counter held at zero. It's not until we're doing it and we do not have a BTU, a bit time up, so we haven't counted up to the specific value, that we then continue to count in our bit time counter. 
The terminal count will depend on the baud rate that's selected. If you recall, the baud rate determines the bit length. And what we want to do is then take the bit length divided by the period of the clock. And that gives us then how many clocks there are in a particular bit time. That comes out of the baud rate decoder as a constant either 19 bits for a Nexus 2 or 20 bits for a Nexus 3, Nexus 4. Whenever our counter reaches the end of a bit time, the bit time up signal goes high, which causes the counter then to reload zeros. And at the same time, it causes the shift register to shift the data to the right one. As it does that, it will also then cause the bit counter to increment by one. So when we're doing it and the bit time up is high, we increment our bit counter. The bit counter we've agreed will count 11 bits. So you should see 11 bits transferred. That means every time there is a communication, BTU should go high 11 times. On the 11th time, the done bit goes high which then resets the TX ready and will turn off the do it and will cause both counters to go back to zero. Now there's a little bit of logic on this diagram that really doesn't belong in the transmit engine. It should be external to the transmit engine sitting between the trammel blaze and the transmit engine. That is the load strobe generator, or I would call this the address decode, as well as the pause edge detect and the interrupt logic. This is the same pause edge detect from our first project. So when TX ready goes high, it will generate a one clock wide pulse out, which will set the interrupt going to the trammel blaze. When the trammel blaze services, it will then clear the interrupt but the machine will then be in full motion transferring the data. One comment about the configuration of your software. Uh, if you have any trouble you should watch the videos that I've posted with Pong Chu covering the chapters at the end of his book. Uh, each of which talks about the assembler, the language, the Pico Blaze, uh, and interrupts. Uh, so everybody should have the information they need to successfully create the project. Keep in mind that it's your responsibility to write the software in the assembly code of the Trammel Blaze that will continuously send out CSULB space CECS 460 carriage return line feed. I do not want that to appear just once. I want it to be a continuous stream. That allows us to easily debug our design. So in your interrupt service routine, basically one approach you could take is that the interrupt service routine sets a flag to indicate the fact that the interrupt has occurred. Your main loop is cycling through always seeing if the flag is set. If it's not, it should be causing the LEDs to switch so that you can see that you're in your main loop. Once you see the interrupt and the flag is set in your main loop, then you should jump and output the next byte to the transmit engine. This involves keeping track of where the data is coming from the easiest thing I have found is that at the start of your code, have an initialization section where you move the sequence that you want to output to the transmit engine into the scratch RAM. Then in your main loop, all you're doing is keeping track of the pointer and the counter. And once you count up to the end, you then reset the pointer, refresh the counter, and continuously output the data. Okay, so hopefully this helps, uh, and uh, I'll see you guys on Monday.